So welcome to the May edition of the Siebel Friday for Siebel 23.5 or just May 2023. I'm glad you could make it and uh, let's see what we have. We start off, of course, with the usual uh, look at the latest Siebel update. So that is where I share my screen. And the screen is visible, hopefully. Okay. It is. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, we start off with the update highlights for Siebel 23.5, which was delivered just spot on in the middle of May. And you might have already downloaded it or even updated. I know that Florian, who is here today, has definitely updated uh, to 23.5 already. And there's some very interesting features going on in two areas. Uh, the first one is the REST API, or more precisely, the inbound data REST API, which is the one for the business objects. And we're going to take a little bit of time and look into that, because that does not only have access control now, administratively, but also features something called dynamic integration objects, which is a pretty cool feature. And also regarding the inbound REST API more generally, we can now allow or disallow anonymous requests with a checkbox. Okay, that's of course some, something, uh, something to tell the round table there. Uh, Web Tools officially has one feature, and you might be surprised not to hear about three features. But um, yeah, as it happened, one feature is delivered in 23.5 officially, which is actually a, a good old um, feature we know uh, all too well. Change records is now available in Web Tools. And then there's some news on the Triple SE and Siebel Cloud Manager. And the Tomcat version is now 9072 for the security people. Okay, so uh, the first thing we talk about is the REST inbound data access control, which actually is happening inside a new view. You find that view in the um, administration web service screen. It's called REST inbound data access service. And that view is one list applet and it has three columns. So it's very lightweight, but it's a great enhancement. The important thing first, uh, if you update to 23.5 or higher, there's a new table obviously generated to back up that data. And that table needs to be populated because from 23.5 onwards, every business object that you want to use in the inbound data REST API has to be registered here with grant access flag set to yes, obviously. Um, it is not necessary to associate an integration object and that's where the dynamic integration objects come in. Um, but for if you, if you think about what happens during an update, of course you are on any older version such as 22.6 or whatever and you do the update, there's a special SQL executed, which reads your integration objects from the RR table and migrates the, the information into that table. And Florian has just confirmed before I started recording that one of his or his one custom business object has made it successfully into that table. Um, the so there's a column for business object. Obviously, that's the name of the business object you want to make accessible. Then there's a column for integration object, which is basically a mapping now. So we all know about those base integration objects, which are required up until now. And now you can leave it blank to use the dynamic IO feature. We'll discuss in a second, or you can actually associate any internal integration object that you happen to have already. So that's very cool. It's, it's actually a mapping now. And obviously the grant access flag works in a way that when you set it to yes, you can 
well, work, work with inbound requests. And if you set it to no, then you get this error message uh, that you see on the screen right now. So I'll, I'll do a live demo, so we'll see all this in action. And if anyone has any experience already with the new 23.5 REST inbound data, uh, please share in the chat. I, I understand the chat is still just for chatting with me, the uh, organizer, but if you send me the chat anyway, I read it out loud. So those dynamic integration objects are really the new and very exciting feature. There is a new parameter on the EI object manager, which is default, which is, well, obviously brought in by the update and then defaulted to true. So the feature is turned on by default. It's called enable dynamic IO in REST. And once the EI object manager has this setting, it goes through a series of decision, a decision-making process, which integration object to use, or if it can't use any, integration object, then it generates it uh, dynamically on the fly. So that is pretty exciting. I, I get excited at least. So if that, if that flag is enabled on the object manager and there is no mapping in that view we have discussed, so you leave integration object empty, uh, then it looks for, it actually looks for a base IO a base integration object. And if that does not exist, it generates an integration object using a very similar service than the wizard we know in web tools, or sorry, SEAL tools, not web tools yet. And that wizard is actually used to generate an XSD file, an XML schema definition file. If you remember in SEAL tools, you can actually generate XSDs out of integration objects. So that is what happens approximately. And that XSD file is saved on the Siebel server. There's a new folder, XSD. And then the XSD is used as an ad hoc definition of an integration object. So that eliminates the need to use those base integration objects or any other integration object at that because it's generated based on the current, uh, current workspace definition, of course. Uh, the current business object and business component da data. So I even tried that with the account business object, which is very big. I, I deactivated the base integration object and it generated an XSD file, which was whoppingly big. It had a few errors first because there's some links not working in, in the account business object, but I deactivated those. And it went about and generated a full integration object definition for the account business object if you wanted to. So that's something we want to see live and I'll demonstrate it. Uh, let's do a bit of review first. So um, inbound REST API in Siebel 23.5 and higher, of course, since IP16 really, you, we have a inbound REST API. IP17, of course, is where a lot of changes were made to the architecture. So for the new stuff is happening uh, right here in the uh, 23.5 in, introduces those dynamic integration objects for the business object data API or slash data. So that's the new stuff. Uh, the, the other stuff is old and still works as expected. So we still have a service, business service API, the metadata API for DRs, only the very exotic one. The, the workflow process API since 22.3. Um, don't forget the migration application, which actually has two APIs, one for the migration application and the special migration file prepare and deploy. And then there's the infamous Cloud Gateway or SMC API. With Cloud Gateway is more appropriate because it's that's what the uh, URL must include. It's only partially documented at the time of this recording. So only what you see in the installation guide or bookshelf guide is actually supported. Okay, let's get back to the data API. So those base integration objects, 
Um, you sure if you ever worked with the inbound REST API, you have seen or you have to work with those special integration objects, which uh, there is a quite a large number of standard business integration objects, which start with the name of base and followed by the name and the exact name of a business object. So that is the first five characters are base and the space, and then it's the name of your business object. And with that technique, you can create one integration object for any business object exactly one, and then it's used automatically until 23.5 um, for the EI Siebel adapter queries and insert and, and upserts, etc. So until 23.4, there is just no way. So I've, here uh, we can compare 23.4 and earlier to 23.5 and higher and see the, well, the growth in functionality so in 23.4, uh, we only have, well, we only have base integration objects. And also the access is defined by the existence of a base integration object. So if that exists, and of course, if you can authenticate against Siebel, you have access to the business object. Now with 23.5 and higher, base integration objects are still, um, still re uh, not required anymore, but they are optional. So they're still there, you can still use them. The access control changes. So we now have this access flag for any type of business object. And also I, I, I will point out a few um, issues or not really issues, but limitations of the dynamic IO is for example, that only if you use a real integration object you can define custom keys, custom user properties, or uh, expose calculated or system fields. Because as you know, the wizard generates an uh, integration objects with all the calculated fields or the integration component fields, mapping out to calculated fields as inactive. And when a dynamic IO is generated, uh, the, the calculated fields are not available for queries, of course, it's only for queries where this is relevant. But this is an interesting observation. So when you want more control, you have to go back to base integration objects, or you can use any or reuse any standard or custom integration object, as long as it's internal and mapped to the business object and its uh, components. Okay. and. Uh, yeah, the, the last thing about the REST API is that now we have a new flag. If you look at, at the AI profile, the REST inbound authentication bit after the update to 23.5 or higher, you will notice a new flag, allow anonymous inbound REST requests. You can turn it on or off with the click of a mouse button. Uh, before 23.5, you just have the username or password for the anonymous user and the official way, weird as it sounds, to disable anonymous access is to enter a dummy, a wrong or non-existent user or password here. So basically it runs into an error condition when you want to, uh, when you're not authenticated and it uses this user and it's the wrong user or password. But in 23.5, this is more elegant with the checkbox. And speaking of anonymous requests, mm, uh, not sure how you like the idea of external users being able to use their browsers and make get calls anonymously into your public Siebel environment if it's public on the internet. So uh, you sure would never probably allow anonymous inbound access. I just find it very, very disconcerting <laughs> to be honest. But of course, to each their own. There is a question from Mario in the chat uh, and locks user on LDAP. Uh, that is related to the anonymous flag, allow anonymous. Yes. Inbound. If just a quick question. So you said it's to disable it, you should enter a dummy password. Oh, it says username and password. Fine. Okay. If you change the username, it's fine. But I thought that idea was not to change username on the, 
only the password and then we get locked out locked out and nobody can use them. uh yeah just use them as well it's fine okay yeah so you can have a wrong username after all and that's that will still work yeah so don't get any lockout problems yeah, of, yeah thanks for pointing that out that could be a, a real problem yes okay so uh let's Let's see this uh, in action a little bit. So I prepared um, a 23.5 environment. Can you still see my screen? Uh, because that is hiding all the controls. Okay, <laughs> hope you can see the, uh, the application here. Yeah, should work, a bit weird. No, it's better. Okay, just have my, my drawing controls back, sorry for that. So here is the new view. As you can see, it's in the uh, web service administration screen, administration web services. It's called inbound REST API access. And most of this stuff is migrated. I've played around. So the after the update, you have all the base integration objects listed here along with their business object. So that's the logic. It takes all the base integration objects imports them into that table behind the scenes and associates the business object here. So action is a good example for migrated and not, not customized. So I added a few things to play around like audit trail. Um, and now I've, I have postman up and I want to, I want to know the version of Siebel. <laughs> so that's a use case for actually dev pops. Uh, Nick has a question. Does it automatically grant access? Uh, yes, it does. So the access flag is set to yes after the update because that's what has to be. You're, you want your inbound uh, REST a, a, data APIs to still be operational after the update. So that comes up with a yes. Uh, good point here. So I want to know the Siebel version through REST. So I figured out there's a business object called system and there's a business component database version. So that, that really exists. So, so it's not making this up. So system business object, a standard business object, and it has several components, including database version, which has the application version field, which I'm interested in to read the application version through the REST API, because that's what I do in DevPops, <laughs> or I want to do in the next DevPops version. So let's see if, how that works out. So I prepare the data call with system slash database version. So that's how you would prepare the, the REST call here. And let's send this off. And I get an error, business object, question mark. Well, it's a bit confused. It doesn't know which business object I really mean. It's not enabled for access via REST. Please enable business object for access via REST. Okay, so that's good. I'm not, I'm not authenticated, so I'm currently allowing anonymous requests, but this anonymous request yielded a 500 error because of that's what you expect that the business object is not accessible, God forbid, by, uh, by anyone. So let's make it accessible. Let's add a new record and enter the business object and no integration object because I don't have any. There, I don't want to generate one. I don't want to create a new workspace. And of course, check the flag, step off, and it's, it's immediate. So when I send this off, Again, I get the data. So I here have my application version 23.5. Okay, so there was no integration object. So what also happened in a new folder called XSD, it's in the Siebel server, an XSD folder. You see the last file was just generated one minute ago. There's an XSD file for the business object system, database version business component. So that's the naming convention and main version zero or latest. I read that as 
never modified, literally. So when you modify it, when you have developer workspaces, as you can see here, played around here, that's the workspace name and version. And there are some other version numbers here. And if we open that XSD file, yeah, it says Siebel XSD generation. And if you ever generated an XSD out of an integration object, that's almost looking the same. It's a little bit different, but that's what you get on the fly. So it didn't find one, it generated this and then used it to run the query. So that's the dynamic integration object here. So pretty cool, isn't it? Okay, so now let's let's up the game a little bit. So I, <laughs> I was busy uh, and so I created a new, very simple business component, BCRM simple contact with a few fields from the S contact table. So active flag, email address, first name, a calculated field for good measure. Okay, very simplistic, as you can see, I created a business object for that. Uh, there it is with the only business component as the primary. So there it is, no link here. It's just very, very simple. And now I want to query that data or even write if I want to, but I want to use that. Uh, so I have created and I'm sending a, a special workspace version because I've delivered this in main version five the first time. And just to confirm main version five, in my system here is where I created that business component and business object. And then version six is when I created integration objects. So version five is not using, it will not find any integration object, especially not a base integration object. So let's check the XST folder first. So there's no BCRM something here. And let's run the Let's run the request. Uh, okay, same thing. So the business object is not enabled. It's a custom business object I just created. It was never it created after the update release. Really, so it was never migrated or it wouldn't like any other custom business component. It wouldn't probably have a representation in a base integration object. So it, it never made it here. So let's add it. Create a new record, please. And also leave the integration object blank. Step off the record. And now we should get some data. And we do. So this is, well, what's happened? <laughs> this is reading version five of main of that business object. It tries to find a base integration object, which it doesn't. So it generates one on the fly. And if you look carefully, the calculated field like full name is missing. Because if you would generate, run the wizard to generate an IO and not, not customizing it after the wizard is finished, you would have to, you would have the full name field, but it would be inactive. So that's what happens if, if I want to have the full name field, I, need to do something else. I need to create an integration object. So let's check if there's an XSD file and yeah, there's the XSD file. Main 056. Yeah, those version numbers are confusing, but <laughs> the five definitely is here. Okay, so it generated the XSD on the fly. Now let's remove this. I remove the XSD and I go to version six of main. And okay, that's different. There is a full name uh, field here. And there's no XSD generated. So in version six, I have a base integration object defined. Let's check version six. I have created a base integration object and I customized it. So just to make sure, let's look it up. So there's one integration component and there's a field 
and the full name field is active. So definitely it was inactive before and I changed this to active to have access to the full name field through the base integration object. Okay, I also created another integration object, um, which with a different name uh, called BCRM Simple Contact IO. And now I'm going to, well, this is not really different, so it doesn't really give us a good example here, but uh, now I'm going to map it. So that's also something you can do. So you can, you can literally pick any integration object that of course represents your business object. So here's that non-base integration object mapped out. Sorry, that was the wrong business object. There we go. And now it will use this one. So I can maybe remove that workspace and still, it should still work, yeah. And again, there's no XSD generated because, well, I'm using a specific integration object. Okay, so yeah, that's, that's a quick uh, demo. Uh, there's also a video uh, accessible currently to uh, silver gold members uh, where I go into a demo. Anything you want to add here? Anything you want to to try? Shake the tree. Any comments? No. Oh. Actually, I have one one question. Uh, how? often is this uh, dynamic IO generated? I mean, if we, if it's dynamically created and we deliver some changes to business component, mm -hmm. that's some, some business object, will it uh, regenerate upon first call or? Uh, yes, it, uh, so that's where, where these version numbers come in. So whenever there's a change to a new delivery, or even if you work, if we work in a, uh, let's say a developer workspace, etc. It always generates the correct version corresponding to that workspace. Yeah, so you might even end up with multiple files on a development environment to use for different workspaces. Okay. Is, is it slow for things like a counter context VC where there's a lot of child VCs? Uh, yeah, I went as far as um, actually, did I delete it? Oh no, there it is, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I went as far and if you ever ran the uh, the wizard on the account business object, uh, you notice there are some error messages there. So you have to get rid of those stale links, I'd say, deactivate those links, but then it succeeds to generate a whopping eight megabyte XSD for the account business object, <laughs> which I, I tried. So it takes, okay. It, it, of course, the first time it generates it, that slows down the process, but once it's generated, it reuses that. But, and of course, the, okay. the huge benefit, uh, I think Mario's question was also uh, towards that. The huge benefit is when you just, you just add a new field to the business component, you know, and it's immediately available in the REST API without having to modify the integration component in an integration object and add, add the field as well or synchronize the integration com, uh, object. So if there's no integration object involved, you always read live from the latest version of that business, of all the business components in the business object. Of course, if it's very huge, like account, uh, and the wizard throws an error in Siebel tools, you have to get rid of those errors first <laughs> uh, because th the same errors actually are then in the log file. So. You see, it's the same the same service literally used to generate the XSD. That's that's and, uh, what would be the practical use for this. I mean, if when we integrate some system with Zebo, we do do not want some automatically generated XSD because we want to control and we always need the 
yeah. some calculated fields. It's this is pretty much for testing purposes. I, I don't see the I don't see the what was the use of it. On the practical dashboard. use case. Well, I'm. It's it's so fresh. I haven't seen it in the wild yet. I've given it a try in DevPops to read the application version without having to create an integration object. So it's kind of makes it easier. You have one less object. But as you say correctly, uh, you want to be in full control of what's exposed to the outside. Not every field in your business <laughs> component. So that's where you use a custom integration object or a base integration object. Uh, and of course the Let's let's face the account integration object. Uh, the, the standard integration object with everything is ridiculously huge, and so you would want to end up with a smaller one, which you can now use. So the I think the more realistic use case, if you will, is to use any integration object rather than the base integration object now. So I think that's where probably most people will end up. Because the problem would be is if you're just generating based upon everything, then it's going to activate all the fields, which is could cause query performance with the SQL. Uh, well, the SQL is, well, depending on what you enter. Uh, of course, if I only have, I can enter a field list, which makes sense for very large business objects or business components, a field list in the, in the URL, like so fields equals. So if you put a field, a field list, does it then only generate the I.O. with those fields or does it generate the whole I.O. and only query uh, those fields? A, a good question. I think it still generates the I.O. with all the fields, but for the query, it only uses those fields. Okay. Yeah. Could do, could do a quick test with, with this one. So let's put it to the test. Uh, uh, let me delete that system. System XST, and now let's query for uh, only application version. So only one field, right? Okay, comes back. It has generated that XST, and it's still all the fields. Yeah. <laughs> so it gener it because it simply runs like when you go to Siebel tools and. I'll create the workspace yeah. first and run the wizard, you know, that integration object wizard in, in Siebel wizard mode, EI Siebel wizard, and you tell it which integration objects, like, well, it's just random, <laughs> just randomly select one. Uh, so. And then you let I mean, it. I can see you let it run through, and it let it don't change any selection from here. Let just let it run through, right? So that's what the XSD is representing, the outcome of the wizard without any changes. So all everything selected. Okay, I'm canceling this. Okay, so I mean, this is a cool tool for development purposes. If you ask me. So let's say you have some huge calculated fields or something, and you just want to check the base fields, and they are not exposed on UI. Sometimes it's easier to do this, or mm -hmm. when you're generating some reports to get the exact yeah I O. But yeah, but be be aware that earlier, it's not for production purposes. Yeah, yeah. When you yes. use when you use dynamic I O, every field in the business component is accessible. So there's no control which fields, and that con that control, of course, is gained by real integration object. Um, okay, uh, sorry, all fields but the calculated fields <laughs> are accessible. Um, so uh, yeah, that flag here. Uh, let's let's give it a try. So now I'm able to query obviously the uh, this this the system. Um, no, with no auth, so that's the point. I'm not authenticated. So, and that's possible. And that's scary, right? It's scary. I'm not authenticated, and my anonymous user is good enough <laughs> to allow leaking the, that information. If if it would be on the public internet, 
that would be public information. So it's very scary. But let's change that. Let's go to SMC and go to the application interface profile. And which is exactly the place where it would go in any version, the rest inbound authentication. But now there's the new flag. So I can just uncheck the flag, save it or submit it. Uh, let's just try again. And I get a 401 unauthorized, which is the correct response. So you're not authorized. Yeah. So let's see if that works with basic auth. Yeah, basic auth, of course, still gets you a response because that's what I'm using on this system. Okay, so new flag here, very, very convenient. I, personally, I think this should be set to, the flag should be unchecked by default, <laughs> especially in production or whatever. So you, I, I, I can't see any use case for anonymous access in production. It's just, yeah, too dangerous. What do you think? Um, yeah, any, let's see, what else do we have in 23.5? We're still on 23.5 uh, inspection mode. Uh, web tools gets, uh, depending on where you look, if you look in bookshelf, there are a few more features mentioned. Um, if you look into the release notes, that were re released after, uh, in a second version, uh, two of the features actually gone missing and not, not being available. So the only feature I'm supposed to talk about here is change records. Well, let's check it out. Well, should we? Or I, I made a screenshot. I think that should suffice. So it works as expected in Thebel web tools now. So you have a in the list applet, you have a menu and you can change up to four fields to the same value in one go. Um, nothing much to say, really. It's, it's nice to see that Web Tools gains yet another feature on, on the road to compatibility with uh, Siebel Tools. Um, if your organization uses Triple SE, you also know what it means. <laughs> the Siebel Server Sync for Exchange. Uh, Exchange now being Office 365. Um, anyone, anyone on the call uses Triple SE? Yes. Yeah, okay, that it was Nick. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we're looking forward to switching to Linux because I had to set up a server Windows instance just for the Okay, and your main, all your Siebel servers are on Linux and or Unix, and you just have to run a Windows server just for that purpose for those PIMC engine just for those components. Yeah, for those components yeah. which require Windows, and that requirement is gone in twenty three point five. So you're looking forward to well trying it out if it really works. Well, I guess so. Uh, so officially, you can now run those. S triple SE components, PIMZ engine and dispatcher on Linux, Siebel servers running on Linux or Unix, which is of course one step ahead to full cloud compatibility, you know, container compatibility, because that's the world of Linux and good news there. We actually have the Windows one running in containers also. Uh, yeah, of course you can run Windows on containers, but. It's pretty weird, but it can, yeah, it can do. <laughs> uh, a, head, a headless Windows, by the way. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the, the headless. Yeah, thing. it's running on Docker just like everything else. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. It took me a little bit to figure that out, but but it does work. It does work, but still a, a pain. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's a pain right. just because we I have to have build both containers now instead of right. having one process. We have two. Mm. So one less thing. That's good. Uh, okay, and if you're so advanced and use Siebel Cloud Manager to generate your Oracle Kubernetes engine YAML-based Siebel environment, then uh, Cloud Manager also gets updates on a monthly basis or even more often. Sometimes there are two releases per month, but I think it boils down to one major 
So the uh, actually just citing the bookshelf guide here on this one. Uh, the one thing that well is surprisingly uh, let's say um, modern is <laughs> to use an OCI service called Vault to store any sensitive credentials which would otherwise have been in any in script files or whatever. So passwords, etc. So this is a new feature in Cloud Manager. So speaking of bookshelf, of course, you would want to go to, well, the place you will know, <laughs> find the 23.5 bookshelf and uh, for example, search for revised, then you will see the Cloud Manager guide, the REST API guide with the stuff we just discussed, uh, the server sync guide, triple SE, and using Siebel tools for those tools features. Okay, I think that's it for the 23.5 overview. So it took a little bit of time here with this one. Uh, Nick mentions the PDF download as of yesterday. Uh, the bookshelf PDF download did not have the revised documents. Is that so? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, well, probably have to tell Oracle SR is open, Nick says on the chat. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's a documentation defect, I would say. Um, personally, I always use the online version. Uh, the PDF sometimes when I want to do a, you know, global search thingy, which is useful, but most of the time I refer to the web version, which is obviously the one that is um, updated. <laughs> okay, hope they fix it. Happened in 23.1.2, says Nick. Okay, that's, that's bad. That's, that's regression creeping in. But nonetheless, there's always a good version there on the web. Um, okay, uh, that's Siebel 23.5, lot to talk about. Um, of course, the, the the usual game applies, how to update. Uh, let's see if I, I have the update path diagram. Hasn't changed, I, I show it every time, just to confirm the R environment, you still have to, well, run post install database update as soon as possible on the first Siebel server, get it out of the way. And if you, well, if you want to do the repository upgrade, of course you have to run it and so forth. So it's nothing really changed here. And maybe one check, one check mark would be on your checklist. If you use the inbound REST API, go and check out that new view if all your uh, base integration objects have been migrated to the new view and all your interfaces are still operational. All right, uh, so uh, next thing on the list for the Siebel Friday is, or the last thing, <laughs> is the OpenUI webinar recap. Yeah, so we holding, or I decided to hold regular webinars, middle of the month usually. So if you look at the Siebel Hub, YouTube channel, uh, pasting the link in the chat. Uh, then there's always something going on on the on the YouTube channel, and you, there's probably one or two videos which you haven't seen. <laughs> uh, so I have, a, I have a lot of videos there, and of course there's the twenty three dot five uh, overview video, short overview. You can share with your peers and say, okay, let's educate ourselves on. 23.5, that's the monthly summaries. And uh, here's the OpenUI webinar replay. So that webinar was called Art of the Possible. And it showcased, let me just fast forward a little bit. Uh, showcased ways to get the most out of OpenUI. So using pyramid <laughs> diagrams. Uh, from simple to complex changes, um, using third-party libraries like React or Vue, very advanced stuff, or doing just simple, th simple stuff. And uh, I also showcased some of the custom U custom Siebel UX screenshots you find on the web. <laughs> so if you search long enough, 
you will find those screenshots and uh, the companies behind those screenshots are listed here as well and the projects they worked for. So uh, kudos to those companies to share that information publicly and uh, also showcase what can be done with OpenUI. If you really put an effort in it, uh, if you make it an effort, then it can be a great outcome for the end users. And the, the webinar was all about that journey, how to get there, how to get skilled up, uh, especially as a Siebel developer, you know, practically all you know is business objects, business components and stuff, but you need to upskill on HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and Siebel OpenUI, uh, maybe some jQuery or other frameworks, then you become an upskilled Siebel developer. And an upskilled Siebel developer is still not a web designer or a web front-end developer. So you still need those persons in in those complex projects which take several months to uh, complete so to put the finger on the pulse of the community we also have the um let me just quickly go there just a second so here's um the polls um and as, you, as a regular on the Siebel Fridays, you know about the polls we do. I'm sending you the link uh, in the chat as well. And there's the, the last poll I did was, is what is the level of open UI UX customization for your Siebel CRM deployment? And if you haven't answered it, please do. And I'll refresh the page in a few moments. So we see the answers coming in. And it surprised me, still surprises me that uh, the most, let's say the vast majority, 70%, is either very serious with JavaScript in terms of physical renderers, presentation models, so classic open UI, you would say, or even goes all in. And that's even more projects claim to be an all in project where you have a complete UX redesign. So uh, if you watch the webinar, of course, good for you. And if you haven't watched it, please please do and maybe share some, some of your thoughts in the comments or just now in the chat, of course, what, what, what is ahead for you on the road to uh, even better UX with, you, you can't make Siebel open UI any better really, no, can you? <laughs> I dare you. Okay. Right, so I'll, I'll just hit refresh to see if anybody voted. And that's one vote. Yeah, we got seven, 37 to 38 here. Not, that was a slight change there. So <laughs> probably in favor of just a dash of CSS, can't remember. Okay, um, so open UI, big topic. If you have anything you want to share or want to see in, a, in the upcoming Siebel Friday, let, let me know. Put your, put your thoughts in the chat. Any comments there? Open your eyes. Of course, one of my favorite topics, as you probably know. All right. Then uh, one, a uh, few more things. Yeah, some, some Siebel Hub updates. Uh, of course, you're registered on the Siebel Hub. You have a free membership that's uh, where your Siebel Hub journey starts. And free, I want to talk about memberships a little bit because we recently changed the membership perks and the free membership still gives you access to any non-public blog posts and pages. And of course it's free, forever free. So uh, you will never have to pay for any content on the Siebel Hub, except of course the the video trainings, which uh, is a lot of work. So those are not free, but the blog posts and pages. Um, then we have a silver membership. And that's, of course, all of the free perks plus uh, silver members get early bird access to videos and special content whenever we publish it. Usually some heavy content like the new, the new features for the REST API, um, we have a limited early bird access for silver and gold members. Uh, 
what's the, what's the special about the gold membership is that you get anything a silver member would get plus you get a 10% discount on all video trainings or actually on the entire Siebel Hub shop. So 10% discount on everything. And that of course pays off it. Uh, gold membership is 50 uh, euros per year. And well, you can do the math so it pays off pretty quickly when you buy one of our training courses. And so that's of course uh, the news about the memberships. There's also a link to let me copy that, paste it in, in your chat. If you want to check your membership levels, there's the URL in the chat. And you can also from there, you can register for higher memberships. So we, we, keep, the, we keep the content coming for uh, silver and gold members and especially check out the 10% discount. And speaking of discount, <laughs> yeah, uh, Watching Siebel Fridays, of course, has its benefits. Um, I, I don't want to really like um, lay too much on on you in terms of these are all the trainings we have. There's a link in your chat right now, and we have 15 training classes fully recorded on video, always up to date. And two of them, the open UI classes, are currently 50% off with uh, code GOSIEBEL23. So if you want to take your chance on learning more open UI, that's a 50% uh, discount until uh, 31st of July, I think. So grab it while it's hot. All right. So that's um, all that is on my agenda. Is there anything on your agenda you want to talk about? Any comments? Any, if you have suggestions for the next Siebel Fridays or for a webinar you want to, you want to see um then uh yeah let me know you you all know where to find me so no comments in the chat um well Mar mario says in the chat you have a few questions okay <laughs> here we go mario i mean i i have a few this is my first civil friday Okay. It was suggested it would be good. <laughs> so you have to, uh, you have to be here. So and recently, have... <laughs> we recently upgraded to 23.1 from 1610. So it's a big jump. Good thing is that uh, UI is still working. So those screenshots you had for A1, A1 Croatia and those slides you showed for UI, it's still working, which mm -hmm. is great. Okay. But we have various uh, interesting challenges. So I see there's a bunch of us here. So I just want to see what's the experience of other people because we have strange issues and we're not getting much help from Oracle support, unfortunately. Okay. So, um, so you, what I understood, you you were you were in fa fainting out a little bit, but um, you you're doing an upgrade currently from IP sixteen to. Uh, we did, we did. Or you did, it's co complete. We, we are in production and we're ah. getting ready for our first release on Upgrade Zebo. Uh, you, and that's the... The first update, the, the first... So yes. what... Uh, I'm, we will not uh, do upgrade of Zebo in, in terms to install this 23.5 because it, we have very bad experience from migrating from 22.3 to 23.1. Very, very bad. Okay. We lost all of, all of our, our customization, but that is, Oracle is working on that. Oh, uh, that sounds very, very, very bad. Is, is it related to the repository upgrade? Uh, the repository was the one part of it, but we, we were able to revert that, but uh, a lot of custom files in uh, Tomcat folders were deleted and uh, uh, that uh, environment variables and stuff like that. Just it wasn't backed up. We didn't um, plan on 
yeah, is okay. able to delete everything. So mm. Oracle is working on that currently. So I expect them to fix that in mm. upcoming versions. Okay. But uh, we are having most difficult issue we have at the point is with uh, runtime repository cleanup. Because we have to migrate repository to production from development environment, but we have two development environments because we had two repositories to perform IRM. And if we run repository cleanup, we lose runtime events and it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. And it's some kind of bug. Is there any other way to delete that repository that's, uh, that's more practical because we cannot do it through tools? Uh, yeah, tools of course, you can, no, you can no longer uh, in IP17 and higher, there's, well, the first thing is, uh, there's probably what Oracle said as well, and I'm, I'm going out on a limb here, and there's there's a lot of support stuff that, that should be really discussed with Oracle support. So as, as a, a precautionary message, because that's recorded as well. If you want me to turn off the recording, you tell me. Um, oh, it's fine. Uh, I escalated that. Mode yeah, before. no, but I, I say as much I didn't get that IP17 and higher is very sensitive towards multiple repositories. So you should, in, in one database, there's only one repository allowed. So the, the, that's called Siebel repository. So whenever you have a second repository in there, for example, after a full migration, and you have renamed, the migrated repository and it's your new Siebel repository and you have the old Siebel repository, you have to delete it very soon because otherwise you get in all kinds of trouble. So whenever you run- No, we noticed. Yeah. <laughs> but if we do delete it, then the, we have to, the only way to delete it is using RR cleanup. And, and so. yes, and you have to delete the repository using RR cleanup, right? Yes, and it deletes uh, uh, records for runtime events, and it does not import it, import them back. Uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's but, very interesting. But it situation. deletes. It deletes. Um, I I have no let's say I have no real time insight into that. But it, it yes, the, the the runtime event tables are affected because uh, of the the workflows using runtime events and stuff. So you have your own yeah, set of yeah. runtime events with every repository, but still you should have the correct runtime events after RR cleanup. So that's probably where the bug is. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to know, is there any other way to get rid of one repository to avoid this RR cleanup? Because Oracle said it's not supported to, uh, to revert old runtime events data, so. To back it up, then yeah. perform cleanup and restore the data. That's not supported, but they're not giving me any any other way to do it. Yeah, it's just the, if Oracle officially says so, then it then that's the law. Yeah. So uh, okay. I was and, hoping someone has a better idea, but yeah, we will have to find some other way. Obviously. Okay. So yeah. So okay. sorry. Sorry to hear that you have trouble with the um, with the migration and RR cleanup, yes. Okay. And uh, I have just one more yeah, question sure. about uh, server session loop. Does anybody use that feature? It's new with 23.1 and our experience are really good. It's, that is server. It should server session loop. It's uh, the part when you do the migration Ah, yeah. Increment migration, and you do not have to log out and log in. Yeah, let me and find that was twenty three dot one. It was introduced, right? Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, if nobody uses it, then I, I won't get any information. I was hoping that some of that's it. Server set all have some experience with it. Mm -hmm. So I just I mean, it, it is it is working, but it's not working well very well, and. Uh, Oh. We have some some situation when it just doesn't update, and you do the logout, login, and it still didn't update, and you have to restart it. You have to restart, have to restart the restart component. Before. Yes, component. Restart of component is enough, but uh, 
I mean, it's a great feature on paper, but uh, it didn't turn out so good on okay. our, in our experience. So okay, I was let's hope maybe let's maybe let's ask has some let's, better idea. let's ask the audience any, any experience with this uh, feature the, um, that is turned on by default, by the way. So <laughs> when you are twenty three dot one or higher, not anymore. <laughs> No, I haven't done one in a while, so no, I haven't tried it yet. See what happens. Okay, so no, no, the the users don't report anything weird. Was that Nick? Yeah, well, we do not. We have not done incremental migrations in a long time. Uh, okay, you haven't done any, and it's only for incremental oh, migrations, by the way. Yeah, yeah, we, we don't know how it will affect anything. Uh -huh. We've only been doing uh, binary updates. Okay. So I, I personally, I gave and it, a, are... I gave it a try. W once this feature came out, I tried it out on an RR environment. I did an incremental migration, uh, and in the same session, I, I was able to see the changes after those. Uh, 900 seconds elapsed, uh, which is the default sleep time. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's generally working. Mm -hmm. If you change some bigger integration object, like a system order or asset, uh, it just crashes, just like the old Zebul crashed if you try to deploy <laughs> one of those objects to runtime. Okay, yeah. So <laughs> it's the same, pretty much the same, but here is the problem. If you do uh, migration to production, and you do not restart the component, nothing works. Yeah. So Configure it won't work. So it's, so it's not very fun to use. So, so you turned it off. You I was turned it off. Maybe we are doing something wrong. But. Yeah. It's, I, I can imagine, and, and that's speculation my side, uh, but I can imagine when there are very, let's say, sophisticated customizations coming together and requiring other stuff like uh, on other components, uh, workflow process manager, you name it. Then I think this this could become an unstable situation that you don't want to have for for your sessions to some sessions using this <laughs> and some sessions using the other version. So probably yeah, we, I mean we already so, ended up in like uh, disabling it. Web services uh, you use uh, ten different workspace versions. So <laughs> we noticed that we have to. Uh, Restart it regularly. There's uh -huh. no other way to have the same version on all all of them. And I mean, server session loop only works for uh, UI. It's, it doesn't work on background components. So that's also a minus, if you ask me. Yeah. Where we need it the most is for the batch components because we don't Where... have to restart those. And, and that... it doesn't log out, log doesn't log out and log in. So it doesn't have a chance to pick up your workspace. Okay. But so. Maybe that will come in the future. I hope so. I hope so. And you're definitely what I recommend always is you get into contact with Oracle and have Oracle understand the problem and they will provide a fix so that that's what should happen. And but uh, thank, thanks, Mario, for pointing this out here in in the Siebel Friday. Yes, that's what Siebel Fridays are for to discuss <laughs> Siebel stuff. And uh, while we obviously cannot provide a solution for those problems because that's Oracle's job. Um, but we can, of course, discuss what are possible outcomes of settings or uh, experiences. All right, so. Okay, thank you. Just one quick question. I think I know the answer, but uh, anybody uses uh, Unix servers with uh, Microsoft database? Unix servers with micro Linux. Microsoft. Yes. I use Linux and Microsoft. Nick is. Okay. Yep. It, the, I mean, we have to do one upgrade for Zebel, and we are currently using the Windows servers, and we do not like that. But we are not very keen to <laughs> migrate database to uh, Oracle SQL. So that should be fine, right? It's Zebel should be free to use any database these days, right? Uh, yeah. The, Not the, any database, there's, there's like three I, databases. I, IBM DB2, Microsoft SQL Server Oracle. Yeah, that's what it's certified yeah. for. Okay. okay. They used to use Sybase, but they quit that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, 
And in front, in front of the they will be framed. So, sorry, say again? How does Zibel behave on Microsoft database? I mean, those joins Zibel makes like 70 or 80 tables. It's, I, mean, I, mean, I do not have experience yeah. with, uh, with uh, tuning on Microsoft uh, server, so. I've never run a big application on the Microsoft servers. I've done it only locally for myself, uh, probably same as Alex has. Uh, yeah. Back, back in the day, handle, the table is fine. I mean, if you give it the parameters and you give it the space, and you set it up correctly, yeah, it shouldn't cause any issues. So, so back back in the really good old Siebel days when Siebel Systems was a company, then uh, we, we we took pride in the fact that Siebel our our own Siebel environments, including production, were not running on Oracle because we officially hated Oracle. <laughs> uh, you know, Tom Siebel versus Larry. Uh, and so I, I, we had a lot of internal systems like for the, for the uh, university that were actually running on SQL Server, but that was in the days, you know, of NT, NT Server, Windows 2000. So probably doesn't compare to what is available today. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is a low, it's, it's not a lot of traffic or usage on that CRM, but, uh, yeah, it, as long we as you have to restart those servers uh, three times a year. And okay. But as we well, don't just here, here. restart the service ever. <laughs> like, like, you want to talk about the windows servers is their memory hogs and they don't clean up well, and you got to reboot them every month. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I'm that's expecting that unfortunately. Yeah, for and OS, pa and, uh, and OS patching isn't anyway. as good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a nightmare. We had, <laughs> we had several customers running large SQL Server databases, and I mean, you'd have to go through the normal process of like checking, maybe adding indexes or tuning queries, just like you would for Oracle. Um, but yeah. on the Windows servers, I mean, you would definitely have to restart them every month just to install the patches, because that's kind of critical stuff. <laughs> Yeah, good yeah, one. that's one of the biggest things we have with ours. We run a large Canadian government department, and uh, uh, it's uh, one of the challenges is doing OS patching on on Windows. Yes, that's the biggest outage. Really, is that monthly uh, OS patching activity? Yeah, I, I wouldn't even want to imagine if you run. Let's say uh, I, I set up an environment with the Windows twenty twenty server. And that, that thing is behaving like Windows 10 or 11. It's like forcing you to update. So there's there's a point in, I think every month at least, it just reboots. <laughs> and, and that on a production server, I, I, of course you have to schedule some downtime Yay. to reboot it yourself. Yeah. I'm so excited about that. Okay, we will definitely move to Unix, it's fine. Yeah, containers it is. It's easier. Con yes. Yeah, we, we only yeah, we have an Ansible script that does a rolling restart of them. Okay, that was a rolling restart I got from the Windows server. Yeah, uh, well, you, there's an Ansible script that does a re rolling restart of all all the Windows servers in the whole, you know, data center pr practically, and they're just included in that. Uh, okay. I mean, uh, we use the same for Unix. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just too, too difficult to restart 25 servers manually takes too much time so you prepare scripts and just run it. so mm -hmm. it's, it's fine we will i think i got what i needed thank you all guys okay yeah thank thanks to you mario and uh, welcome to the siebel friday club and that that was uh, very lively siebel friday um thanks thanks for that it will be on youtube shortly uh, for review sharing with your colleagues so yeah, thank, thank you, everybody, and um, have a great, great weekend, and uh, stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay,